that I believe God wants me to share with you. Now, for those that want to take notes, I've titled this, This Little Light of Mine. And I'm going to start with that scripture from Matthew. I'm just going to turn that a little bit. Oop. So I can see a little bit better. Yep. No, you're right. You're right. It's fine. It's fine. Yep. From Matthew 5, 14 to 16. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot... Ah, oh, that's better. I'm still getting used to these Wi-Fi books. So, uh, I forgot to pack my ready glasses, believe it or not. So, um, a city that is set on the hill cannot be hid. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lamp stand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And that's what I want to start with. That they can see our good works and glorify God in the heavenly places. That's a part of what I do with the guitars. By going out in the highways and byways and compel them to come in that they may glorify God, our Father, Amen. and see his good works through us Amen. and hopefully come to the knowledge that Jesus Christ is the Saviour of the world who came and died for their sin just as much as he came for mine. That's the message for all of us, to let our lights shine. So in a second I'm just going to put my hat on because I, I usually deal with the hat and there's a little light in the hat as you can see. Mm -hmm. 
thinking works. <laughs> so the, the first instrumental I'm going to do, because uh, forgive me, I'm not going to sing because uh, as I sort of shared once before, my, my voice is an anointed folk horn and it really does sound like a folk horn than a singing voice. So I'm just going to do an instrumental and this song that I'm going to play is this little lot of mine, my interpretation on my box. of Christ. As Christians we are ought to let our light shine in the world. But what exactly does that mean? I'm just going to take that up. <laughs> That's so what does that mean? This little light is mine. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, all the time let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, all the time let it shine. Won't let Satan blow it out, no. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, all the time let it shine. Again, in Matthew 5.14, it states, Matthew 5.15 Nor does a light that's on a, a lamp but puts it on a basket a lampstand. That's better. We don't put it under a basket. We are not to hide it, but to let it shine. And this song reminds us it's a simple, simple truth. Now, one of the interesting things is when we put a light on, it chases out darkness. There is no darkness when we switch a light on. And that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be a light in a very dark world. And the more that we unfortunately look around us, we notice that the darkness seems to be growing. But in this time, God's grace is more that we should be able to stand up and shine. It doesn't mean to fight with those out there, but to let our light shine in love, in grace, in the mercy of God, that others may see what we do, how we act, and glorify God. The church, the city, cannot and should not be hid. It is to be fulfilling Christ's message, Christ's message. And the purpose of the light, again, is to shine, to point to Jesus. Men don't light a candle or a lamp to hide it. No, it is used to light and to be safety, to bring light to our feet, to the places we walk, and 
to see what in front of our feet so we don't trip over. It's also to shine in darkness to dispel the fear that so easily grips us. And the more that we look around today, we can become frightful, we can get overwhelmed by situation. But the light of God that shines into our heart and into our spirit dispels the fear, dispels the darkness. And it's so easy. My guitars, my instruments, what we do, it's made out of junk. And unfortunately, there's a lot in the world, I shared this when I got up the other week, that a lot of people feel like junk. They feel like they're no good. You know, they, they've been placed in a dark place for various reasons. You know, whether it's financial or hardship or whatever. It, it's the nature of sin to put us into darkness, yeah. into hard places. But when Jesus comes in, he's the light of the world. He's the light that shines in the darkness and the darkness has to flee. Amen. And for that reason, the church, us, need to be examples of light. God brought light into your life. In 2 Corinthians 4, 6 it says, For it is God who commanded light to shine out of the darkness, who has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. God intended for our light to be seen. There's also a warning in John 3, 19 to 21. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. For well, everyone who practices evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be cleanly seen, that they are done in God. And in John 1, 5, it says, In the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. It's so mind-blowing that light dispels darkness. I don't know if you've ever been underground and they, the lights go out, but it's a terrifying prospect. You know, or a night when there's no light at all. And sometimes you don't know where you are, whether you're going front, backwards, up or down. Like Dad and I have done some scuba diving at night. And sometimes the lights go out. And it's quite amazing, you know. Um, as divers, we have backup lights and glow sticks and more lights you can poke a stick at. And sometimes that people put on Christmas trees, we've got lights everywhere. <laughs> But it's a frightening prospect because in that instance you don't know what's up, what's down, or what's around, lurking in the darkness. You know, and your mind can play fearful tricks. I remember one night I'm in the water with a with another novice diver, and, that, and I'm swimming in um just out of the corner of my light there was this shadow. I didn't know what it was. I, the other divers are already gone because we were last to get in and swimming about. And that shadow sort of just played in the back of my mind. What was it? <laughs> you know? And for some reason, as divers, that, that dun, 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 starts to play, oh, you resonate in you. And I'm thinking, I've got a student kid that doesn't know <laughs> much, you know. Uh, I think it might be a better idea just to get out of the water. <laughs> so we head back to the wharf and climb the ladders and just then a seal head popped up, you know. <laughs> so it wasn't nothing serious, but again, you know, when the lights don't work or penetrate the darkness, 
Our anxieties and fears can overwhelm us. And that's why we need to have faith in God. For exactly the same reason. We need to have faith in God. Because God dispels the darkness, the fears that so easily grip us. A little while back, I had a major incident in that I went into hospital for a very, very minor procedure. The procedure went well, and we were on the way home, Dad was driving, and about half an hour from home, apparently I stopped breathing, my eyes rolled back in my head, I was gone. He apparently thumped me, got on the phone to the hospital and they said, oh, we'll send an ambulance and Dad said, don't bother, I'll beat any ambulance to back to the hospital. And apparently he did. They kept me in for four hours observation, they couldn't work out what actually went wrong. So they sent me home again. Again, within a short distance of home, apparently I went again. Dad bumped me and shouted out to me and apparently I didn't respond. So around the car again and another very, very quick flap back to the hospital. You know, pray to God. You know, whatever his will be done. Not what we want, but what God does. Anyway, I get back home and, uh, sorry, back to the hospital and apparently by this time I'm coming around but very groggy and un unaware of my circumstances. This side they decided to keep me in overnight rather than the four hours. They called in the specialist anesthesia that worked on me that morning, took more blood tests, did more tests, had absolutely no idea what went wrong. To this day, don't know. You know? And I said, it doesn't matter, I'm in God's hands. You know, which spoke to them and spoke to me, you know. And at that moment, I made a choice to dispel the darkness. I wasn't out of the woods yet because I had my ups and downs. I still do. But when God is in control and in your life, it makes no difference. It makes no difference. The fear dispels. Now, there's an example given to us in John chapter 1, verses 6 to 9. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of the light. And that light was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. This is a testimony of Jesus coming. But it's also a testimony of how we should be a light in the world of darkness. Just as John was a light to proclaim the coming of the Messiah, we too can proclaim that Jesus came and he's coming back again. That's the important thing. He's coming back again. Amen. And we need to tell people, we need to warn people that there's a day coming, a day of judgment for those that don't believe, a day of celebration for those that do believe. But we need to be a light in the darkness. In John 8, 12, and Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Again, what's the purpose of being a light? And we see in the scriptures, there's an example given to us. It was given to a man named Saul which is a good example because Saul was a bit of a Pharisee. And you know, 
It takes the Pharisee, it takes religion to mess up something so, so simple. Mm. <laughs> it really does. I, 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 I remember when I originally was doing my um, studies through college, I remember sitting under an old pastor who was the start of a denom major denomination in this country, his grandmother actually, but um, I remember old pastor Fred looked at me and he said something to me at the time that I didn't understand. He said, with much study will come much question. And I had no idea what he meant. But as I started to study and read my Bible, there came a point when I started to grasp a little bit of wisdom. And I still haven't got much, but I've got a little <laughs> bit of wisdom. One, Jesus loves me. This I know, the Bible tells me something. So simple. So, so simple. But getting back to that, with much study will come much questioning. In my study, I got to the point where this overtook this. And I had to make a conscious decision whether to go by knowledge or walk by faith. And you know what? Faith will win every time. Why? Because it's not rational. It's not logical. It's not wisdom. Because the Bible tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence not seen. We don't see it. We can't really explain it. It just is. And the Bible tells us to come with the faith of a child. And the little ones here this morning are testimony to that. You know, we don't fully understand it. And we're not maybe supposed to. We just got to believe it and do it. And that, this might all seem funny and a lot of gun, and to many it is. But to me, it's shining the light in a dark world. It's making a difference where people don't go. In the clubs and pubs. Yes. Out on the streets. Amen. You know, with people that I think Jesus would have hanged with. Not because he wanted to associate with their sin, but to be a light in a dark world to say, hey, there's a better way. There's a better way. How do I know? He did it in my life. Amen. He did it in your life. Amen. It's so, so simple. Be a light in a dark place. Yes, Lord. And this is in 1 John 1 5. It states, This is the message which has sorry, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Getting back to that man named Saul. Saul was, as I said, a Pharisee, a persecutor of the church, a religious man who unfortunately worked, walked by the works of the law rather than by faith. Then God came to you as light shining on the road to Damascus. And this is what he said to Saul, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of their sin and an inheritance amongst those who are sanctified by faith in me. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. 1 John 1, 7.
Again, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Yes, Lord. As a Christian, your light is to shine. It is to praise God, to glorify God. Yeah. It is not for self-gratification. No. This is not really for my glory. Playing in the clubs and pubs was the furthest thing from my mind. Playing in church was the same. I remember one day we were at a big, big international conference and I had, because we were living on the side of the church of the campgrounds at the time, I had my banjo and I was just mucking around playing the four songs I know on the banjo. On those things I think I'd play six, if I'm lucky, on a good day. And I remember these young fellows, they weren't even, I think young Clinton wasn't even 21 at the time, came up and said, hey Shane, Seamus, play with us up on the stage. And I went, no way. <laughs> these guys were really talented musicians. And, and I remember young Clinton, he looked me straight in the eye and he said, Seamus, that is the lamest excuse I have ever heard. <laughs> and the car, but then he went on to say, he said, because there will always be someone better. Yeah. You play the way you play. Yeah. You don't have to play like anyone else. Amen. And y yes, it cut, it hurt, but I also knew it was set in love. And you know, I went away and thought about it and sometime later another chap that I know said very similar, you play like you, you don't play like me or anyone else, you don't have to. So I went, yeah there's something in this. So then I started going to um, open mics and for anyone who has ever been up on a stage, it's a terrifying press, especially when you've got talented, and I mean talented people in the audience that can play, that even read music, know what the little dot on the page mean. As far as I know, it's my book. I don't understand it. I, I, I've had the banjo for over 25 years, over half my life, and I still don't understand it. My brother can pick up an instrument and play anything. Me, it takes me years to learn something and then to be able to play something. But it's God's grace that makes the difference. It's God who makes the difference and shines his light in a dark place. I remember one night I had my one string diddly bow. I've got an example over here. It's one string. This is not the instrument I played that particular night, but I get up and with one string I played when the saints go... No, sorry. Amazing. Yeah, when the saints go marching in. When the saints go marching in. Afterwards, I get off stage and I'm almost mob. Now, I don't understand why. It's just one string and, you know, not a very good player. This, this fella comes up afterwards. He said, I'm a professor at the Conservatorium of Music here in town. You have just blown 43 years of theory out the window. I do not know how to approach my students tomorrow morning. <laughs> You have just done what seems impossible. You played melody, rhythm, with a beat on one string. Uh -huh. I'm still trying to get my head around it. And that's the glory of God. Amen. To profound, to shine a light in a dark place. We went on to share a little bit, you know, and I'm not a person that beats people over the head with the Bible. Why? Because I don't believe that's the way Jesus did it. Yeah. He shined his light in a dark place, in a dark world, where to do the same. 
In our course conversation, we shared, he said, what do you do, what do you do? And I said, well, believe it or not, I'm a minister of the gospel. This is just my hobby. But sometimes God pushes us out of the boat onto the water. <laughs> and as divers, I know what's underneath. <laughs> and I've done the Peter thing of trying to walk on water and ended up departing the sea like no good. Mind you, the lead weights and the weight belts do not help and you go straight to the bottom like Jonah. But that's a, sometimes a good place to be. Because it's in those experiences that God speaks. God pours out his light and shines in a dark place and reminds us that we're to be likewise to let our little light shine. So I'm going to finish with one more tune. Aww. Put the guitar on and get set up. <laughs> oh, Take those silly things off. So that's true. lights do absolutely nothing <laughs> except people say what is it wow. and that's an opportunity to share yep. it's, it's, it's like the little backpack amp with lights here <laughs> I designed it to be able to walk down the street and then my back said give it a rest <laughs> <laughs> so it sits there as a stage prop most of the time as an amp I do use it. I do use it. Uh, I'm actually designing for the bigger amp a, a trolley like an old music machine sort of thing. Again, it will have smoke and whistles and lights and uh, because that's that's just who I am. I'm a creative guy. I, I sometimes think too much, but you know, God God's a creative God. He takes a worthless piece of junk, piece of dust like me, and he said, guess what, I'm going to make a new thing here. I'm going to make a new creation. Just like he did with all the youth. And God's not finished. And the song that I want to share is exactly the same. Many people know the song. But they don't know the circumstances around the song or why the song came to be. And I'm going to finish with this because this is one song that I share in the clubs and pubs. And everyone's heard the song, but not everyone's heard the story. And the story is about a man. He was a slave boat captain. And apparently one night, well, Cutting his cargo of human suffering. One of those very in his care witnessed to him in a storm. And apparently during the storm when all life was apparently going to be lost, tossed overboard and going down with the ship, the man cried out to God. God saved him. Later he wrote these words, put to music, he ended up leaving the slave trade and becoming a minister of the gospel. Amen. Fought very, very hard to abolish slavery. That man was John Newton. The song, Amazing Grace. Here's my version.
This I, sorry, this I set up as a base, um, my diddly bow, which is different and I haven't, I haven't got one actually at the moment. Sorry. Um, the diddly bow is a similar concept, but the string is like a guitar string. And how that came about was Back in the slavery days in, in the lower states of America when slavery was that sort of thing, unfortunately, a man would take the wire off an old straw broom, walk out to the barn or onto the veranda and nail a nail about yay high, another one about here somewhere, Take that wire or cord, stretch it tight around those nails, put a, usually a glass bottle or a stick or something to lift that string off from the barn wall or the post. Then he would take, usually it was a glass medicine bottle. In my case, a slide, and he will pluck the string and rub up and down that and that was to emulate the vibrato of a human voice. Oh. Oh. It's the same principle. Apparently uh, guitars and violins and string instruments are really good at that. I've been told you can do it on a piano. I believe those that say so but <laughs> I'm, I don't play piano so I don't really know. And that was to accompany the human voice, as I said, that they could sing their songs, their songs that they did out in the field, the songs they learned in the church, to accompany them. Now, it was pretty soon that they realised that they couldn't take the barn with them, or the, the post holding up the ring. <laughs> they couldn't walk around with that. So they, they found by putting a stick into a cigar box. Mm -hmm. No, these are not cigar boxes and I don't advocate smoking. <laughs> I build my boxes from scratch, but the principle's the same. They shove the stick into the box, put it one or various strings on it, grab a pill bottle, tip the pills out, put it on their finger and start sliding and they realised that they could walk around and start to get a tune out of these things and that's how the cigar box tradition basically started in there's examples back in the 1800s but it really took off I think more so in by what I can understand in the research that I and others have done in the in the 20s during the depression era when things were tough and they had to make do Apparently, there's examples here in Australia too. And, that, and uh, again, my little embellishments is just to make it interesting. 
I originally was going to put a little smoke machine in here. Uh, the idea was there, but it just didn't work out. When I unbowed this at a at an open mic night, a guy saw it and he said, "What is it?" And I said, "That's what it is," because mm -hmm. I don't even know. <laughs> it, it, sorry, it, it's based. It was my idea to be based upon a banjo, but it is an in, in entirely different instrument different instrument all together. It, it's three and a half strings, where my real banjo at home is a five string banjo. So this is a mutation, it sounds nothing like a banjo. It's made out of a soup can down here, um, a pie dish. These I had left over from something else. Um, what else is piece of timber, the little dish that I found at some second hand store that just sort of looked good. I put the gauges in at the moment, it does nothing, there's no lights in this yet. Uh, when, I, when I built it, I hated it. Um, I took it to a praise and worship weekend, which we were actually we're going to stop in the place on the way home. So, hello Kim. Uh, and it was Kim that actually encouraged me. He said, I like the sound of that. So over the course of the weekend I had this and I, I wasn't in a very good place at that time. I, I, I just got out of hospital again and wasn't brilliant. So I sat there for the weekend tinkering with this thing. By the time I went home, I did not throw it on the fire, which I had planned to do. It's still with me. Um, and God's using it. So I'm, I'll just do a little number on this. God is still working on me. He's still shining that light here. I've got to just wipe the dust away every now and again and say, okay, Lord, do what you need to. We have seen God move miraculously 
And I won't keep, I won't keep going. Sorry? Oh. You're saying that I've got too much junk in front of me. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, so, never in my wildest dreams would I have thought that this is becoming my new ministry outlet. But you know what? It's, it's okay. Whatever that glorifies God. Whatever shines his light in dark places, I do. If I look like a fool and am a fool for his sake, so be it. You know, David danced before God. You know, people thought he was a fool at times. I mean, good company. You know, Peter had his foot in his mouth most of the time. You know, I pulled my feet, foot out of my mouth a lot of time. I mean, good company. Amen. It's letting the light of God shine. And that's my encouragement to you today. To go from this place, let God's light shine through you, work through you, encourage you, and build you. Yes. That others may see your good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. Amen. Amen. Amen.